Number 5. The Anguished Man The tale of this rather disturbing looking painting is strange and steeped in mystery, but every scant piece of information we have on it is more unsettling than the last. The painting of a featureless man who seems to be screaming was apparently painted by a deeply troubled artist who mixed his own blood with his paints in an effort to get the right shade of red. Not long after completing it, the artist took his own life, and the painting found its way into a woman's care. She kept it for many years, but claimed that once she put the painting up, her and her family began to see a dark, shadowy figure roaming about their house. At night, they would hear strange sounds like footsteps and crying. The woman took the painting down and kept it locked in her attic for 25 years until she died, leaving the painting to its current caretaker. Sean Robinson. Sean had been warned by his grandmother that the painting was haunted, but he thought little of it. Robinson kept the painting in his basement for about a decade, before rediscovering it and putting it up. Once again, the family began seeing the dark, shadowy figure roaming the halls and hearing the sound of weeping and moaning during the night. Sean began leaving a camera on by the painting to try and get evidence of its paranormal nature, and upon reviewing the footage, heard some odd noises and saw evidence of doors opening and closing seemingly by themselves, and the painting falling over onto the ground. As time went on, the activity became more and more intense, with his wife seeing a strange mist and an unseen force pushing his son down the stairs. Things went from bad to worse when guests who came to see the painting began reporting intense and sudden nosebleeds. Sean takes the painting out from time to time to show it to paranormal investigators and television programs who want to hear his story but otherwise, the anguished man is apparently kept locked away in a safe location to prevent any further harm from coming to unwitting people. Number 4. Robert the Evil Doll We've all heard of the cursed Annabelle doll that has permeated pop culture for the last decade, but have you heard of Robert? Robert was a gift to a young boy of the same name, Robert Eugene Otto, from his grandfather. The grandfather had been traveling in Germany and came across the doll who was not intended to be a toy, but a window display. He bought the doll for his grandson, who dressed it in a sailor's outfit that he had outgrown and kept it with him at almost all times. As the young boy grew up, witnesses remember his relationship with the doll seemed to grow more and more unhealthy, with him referring to the doll as a living person and blaming mishaps on him. The boy, who went by his middle name, Jean, grew up to be an eccentric artist in a stately home known as the Artist's House. He kept Robert by the upstairs window, where children claimed to see him moving in and out of view. When Jean died in 1974, the new owner of the house, Myrtle Reuter, found the doll and became its new owner. Visitors of the house began reporting the sound of giggling and footsteps coming from the attic where the doll was being kept. When the doll was around people who spoke ill of its original owner, some claim that his facial expression seemed to change. After Myrtle got sick of the doll apparently moving around the home by itself and scaring guests for 20 years, she chose to donate Robert to the Fort East Martello Museum in Key West, Florida. Robert now resides in a locked display case to prevent the over 120 year old doll from decaying further, but also to protect the visitors of the museum. But even those precautions don't seem to always work. Guests who insult Robert at the museum report experiencing tragedies in their lives not long after. This has ranged from people losing their jobs, getting divorced, breaking bones, getting into automobile accidents, and even a few deaths. The doll reportedly receives letters every day from admirers, people wanting the doll to curse their enemies, and a few from people asking Robert to reverse the curse they believe he has laid upon them. Number 3. The Crying Boy Painting Some of my favorite cursed objects are a good haunted painting. Maybe it's because I had a huge fondness for Ghostbusters 2 as a little guy and it's got a haunted painting as the main bad guy of that movie. Maybe it's just because I'm very enticed by the uncanny valley of a pair of eyes that you can look at, but can never look at you back. We'll probably uh, mention that in therapy next time. Anyway, case in point, take a look at this painting, The Crying Boy. Looks like a fairly normal painting, wouldn't look too out of place in your dentist's office. It's not really my kind of art, but I'm sure a generation of grannies love to put this in the parlor. It's been the center of a series of strange coincidences that are just too darn odd to be true. It was painted by an Italian painter, one Giovanni Bragolin, and mass produced as a print across the 50s, so everyone could enjoy this sad 
sad crying boy in the comfort of their own home until they would burn down. Because for some bizarre, possibly paranormal reason, firefighters around Essex, London would report that frequently amidst smoldering ruins of a burned down house, repeatedly they would find the crying boy painting completely untouched by the flames even when everything else had burned to ash. Now, this happens once, that's bizarre. Two, very strange. If this happens three times, you've got yourself an outright paranormal mystery on your hands. The British tabloid The Sun loved the story and was spreading stories of the cursed paintings like a house on fire. Too soon? The Sun printed out warnings of people who owned the painting and that they should get rid of it, lest they find themselves smelling smoke. The story was so popular and people were so invested in the curse of the crying boy that The Sun tried to take it upon themselves to rid London of the curse by, get this, holding a bonfire in which anyone who owned a print of the cursed painting could come, torch it, and hopefully exercise whatever demons had got into the printing press. The bonfire was a raging success, with sackfuls of the prints being torched, seemingly ending the curse of the crying boy. After hearing about this story though, does anyone else kind of want one of the prints? I don't know, there's just, there's something about it. Number two, the Hope Diamond. The Hope Diamond has shown up more than a few times on this channel and for good reason. It's considered one of the most haunted rocks on the planet. The diamond was first uncovered in India, with reports purporting that the diamond was plucked from the eye of a statue of the goddess Sita, the goddess of beauty and devotion. Legend has it that the first person who stole the diamond was mauled by dogs shortly after taking it. That's a pretty quick curse. From here, the diamonds passed through countless hands, never staying in one place for too long. It's said to have been owned by King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, who as far as I know, never had anything too bad happen to her. Nothing worth losing your head over worrying about. That's a little, uh, little history joke for you. Throughout the diamond's storied history, it's been said that just about every owner suffered a horrific fate. 14 confirmed deaths and owners throughout history, and that's only the ones we know of for sure, as there could be countless more. The jeweler who recut the stone into its current form, William Falls, died a ruined man in poverty and hardship. His son Hendrik stole the stone from his father, who would later be prompted to take his own life for the crime. After passing from owner to owner under grisly circumstances, it made its way to Harry Winston, an American jeweler who possibly making the only good choice of anyone on this list, thought it better to play with his odds and donated the diamond to the Smithsonian Museum in 1958 where it currently resides sealed away. The curators of the Smithsonian were thrilled to receive it and have said that they consider the gem a crown jewel and that in all the time it's been in their watch, no one has suffered any ill effects. Maybe Indiana Jones was right. It belongs in a museum. That's, that's too many Indiana jokes in one video. Too many Indiana jokes. I'm just, I'm excited about the new one. I can't believe old Harrison Ford's coming back again for the millionth time. He's always coming back. Number one, Robert the Doll. Every good list of cursed objects should definitely include one cursed doll. I know we had the shadow doll up there, but that was like a starter curse doll. We got better ones. So that's why we're gonna finish up this list for today with a classic haunted doll. Dolls are just inherently a little bit scary when they're not being used for make-believe. And they're especially scary when they carry a series of unfortunate urban legends with them, like the case of Robert the Doll. Maybe you've even heard of Robert the Doll. Maybe from this very own channel. Maybe from this very own host, because I mentioned him in the first video that I ever did. It's all full circle. He's one of the more notable cursed dolls out out there. If you're in the cursed doll community, you probably know him. Robert has been haunting for over a century. He used to be the property of one Robert Jean Otto, although he shared a name with a doll he preferred to be called Otto. Maybe because of the doll he wanted to be called Otto. Anyway, Otto received Robert as a boy from his grandfather who obtained the doll through unknown means. Trying to trace wherever it came from has proven fruitless as no toy company has ever been found to have produced it. Now the young Otto loved Robert and had a very active imagination to a degree that would unsettle his parents. Parents. He would refer to the doll in first person and brought it everywhere with him, even dressed it in his own clothing. Otto would say that he would hear Robert talk to him and would see him move. Children who passed the homestead when walking by would say that they claim that they saw Robert in the windows watching them. Otto would blame all these mishaps on Robert. Injuries, breaks, anything that happened, it was because Robert had told him to do it or that Robert the doll had done it. And this behavior kind of understandably deeply worried Otto's parents. Otto kept Robert until the day of his death in 1974, where he then traveled from home to home, causing a path of misfortune wherever he went until he eventually found himself in the Key West Art 
expert in historical society, where he's now kept under very tight lock and key and has become the museum's most popular attraction, where visitors leave him offerings, treats, and even writing letters asking for protection or for him to curse others. Employees of the museum say sometimes they feel uncomfortable around him and have noticed a chill in the air by his seat or electrical malfunctions near where he sits. It's been said that they need to stay on his good side lest they provoke his wrath. Maybe it's a good thing then that he's locked up tight in that glass case and there's just something about this guy. And Robert, Robert the doll, if you're watching right now, just want you to know all that stuff I was saying, I was just playing. You know we're friends. You know we've always gone together, you and I. You know I'm a big fan of the scary doll community. I just wanted to make it clear, we're cool. Number five, the family jewels. Some things get passed on generation to generation. Some are begged, some are borrowed, and some are stolen. Our first cursed item has made its way across the many seas at the price of many lives. At a whopping 186 carats, the Koh-i-Noor diamond may look precious beyond all belief, but this cursed gemstone has a much darker, unbelievable side too. The name derives from the Persian Hindi words mountain of light. Many theories exist as to its original owner and who was originally cut for. A Hindu description of the diamond warns that quote, he who owns this diamond will own the world, but will also know all of its misfortunes. Only God or women can wear it with impunity. Well, that's jarring to say the least. Right there in writing, huh? Yeah. It passed between the hands of various rulers, blood-soaked era after another, a king who blinded his own son and a ruler whose head had become encrusted with liquid molten gold was paid for this price. Legend has it that the stone's origins of causing death and misfortune to any male who owns or wears it stems from brothers murdering each other to even sons murdering their fathers over it. But does it actually carry a curse affecting men who wear it? First owned by the emperors of the Mughal Empire in India, it was taken and added with the Timur ruby to make an armband for ruler of the Peacock Empire. The diamond then went to Sikh Maharaja Ranjit Singh. After his death, his five-year-old son Duleep Singh, the last Maharaja of the Sikh Empire, would be the last male who ever seemed to wear it. Since being owned by the British royal family, and oddly enough, it's only ever been worn by females. Huh. After Queen Victoria's death, Queen Alexandra got it and was used to crown her at her coronation in 1902. The diamond was then transferred to Queen Mary's crown in 1911 and finally to the Queen Mother's crown in 1937, where it remained for more than 80 years. When Queen Elizabeth died in 2002, the crown was placed on top of her casket for the funeral. All of the crowns are now on display in the Jewel House at the Tower of London, with crystal replicas of the diamonds set in the older models they were in. So what's the deal? Is this thing still cursed? Did the royal family know something that we didn't? Maybe. Number four, the statues of Lem. The women of Lem statue was discovered in Lem, Cyprus in 1878 and dates back to about 3500 BCE. The statue eventually earned the nickname the Goddess of Death after four different families experienced tragedy while handling and owning the carved stones. The first owner, Lord Elfont, along with his entire family, perished within six years of owning the statue, all from mysterious and rapid illnesses. The other two owners, Ivor Minucci and Lord Thompson Noel, also died along with their entire family's just a few short years after obtaining the statue within their homes. The fourth owner, Sir Alan Biverbrook, died alongside his wife and two daughters of mysterious causes while in possession of the carved rock. Although his sons did not believe in the curse attached to the statue, out of fear of the sudden misfortunes around them, they decided to gift the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh the find, where it is now encased in glass, safe, unable to bear any other family bad news. You gotta think, someone was just like sitting there back then chiseling this rock like 6,000 years ago. What were they thinking? What were they saying out loud? What were they looking at? Why did they seem to have blessed this rock with so much evil and misfortune? You tell me. In third place, we have a satanic idol. So this story began in 1991 when a deer hunter was walking through the woods in Connecticut close to where Ed and Lorraine resided. The hunter got lost and after some time stumbled upon a raised circular rock formation with the idol in question standing in the middle of it. It is believed that the formation was common with folks who practiced devil worship in the 70s. The hunter began to feel uncomfortable and left the area, deciding to make his way back to his car and along the way he noticed an elderly gentleman walking alongside him who was dressed head to toe in black. Now the man in black never spoke a single word to the deer hunter. The hunter was getting more nervous by the second and also more lost and unsure of his direction path. Desperate, he turned to the mysterious figure and simply asked, how do I get out of here? Luckily for our narrator, the man in black pointed in a direction and then 
disappeared. The hunter was so thrown off by that day that he reached out to Ed, who requested to be brought to the same area. The hunter wasn't 100% sure he could find the exact location, but was willing to try. Together, the men were able to stumble through the forest, and without the aid of the man in black this time, found the rock formation. Ed removed the demonic idol from the area and placed it at home in his museum, and that's when things got a little weirder. Because you know, a man in black spotting and weird forest stuff isn't weird enough for us. Approximately three days after removing the idol, Lorraine collapsed for no known reason, and she was transported to the hospital where no one could identify what was wrong with her. Thankfully, after three more days, she recovered. Uh, red flag time! Threes and sixes are very popular numbers amongst the demonic scary people and things that you want to avoid. Ed believed that this was caused by the gentleman in black, who was believed to have been a high priest in a satanic cult, as a form of payback for removing the satanic idol. Now, this idol remains in the Warrens Museum to this day, and honestly, I think it looks like a paper mache masterpiece of an alien, but please let me know in the comments if anyone out there has a different opinion. Mm. In second place, we have a shadow doll. So among one of the first haunted items visible in the museum to visitors is a shadow doll, which boasts bird feathers and a genuine human tooth. Mm -mm. Unlike the other dolls included in the museum, I'd consider this creature more of a sculpture, Ergo, why she made her way to my list today. Also, she's just overall terrifying to look at. I'm calling it now. She better join the TV universe soon. So a shadow doll is a statue or deity of sorts that is made specifically for harm and to be used at the center of curses. I happen to know the steps for the most common curse, and while I'll leave out a step for safety, yes, I promise I'll elaborate. So the caster would first need to take a picture of the doll, write a curse on the back of the photo, and then send it to whomever the curse is aimed for. The person who receives the picture with the curse will sadly invite that curse into their lives. I'm thinking, oh, totally forgot. The doll will also appear in that person's dreams. While not too much is known about the origins of this specific doll, it was initially purchased in a vintage store under the assumption that it was, you know, simply an antique. I have a couple of antique dolls myself, and I'm shuddering to think about what they would do if activated by any kind of curse. They've already got enough of a personality. Thanks. In our first place, we have a copy of Crying Boy. So when Bob Smith was a young child in the 70s, he became fascinated by a painting in his grandmother's house. The painting was a cheap print of a well-known piece and was hung on the living room wall. The photo depicted a boy who was a similar age to Bob and for some reason looked sad and downcast with tears brimming from his troubled eyes. A few years after the painting went up on the wall, there was a devastating kitchen fire in the house. While the kitchen was destroyed, the rest of the house was undamaged. The painting was eventually sold in a garage sale to Ed Warren himself. For years it puzzled Bob why his grandmother got rid of the painting, until he read a series of articles about a cursed painting. Yep, that painting was The Crying Boy. That's the title of the painting. The Crying Boy was one in a series of paintings by artist Giovanni Bregolin that was completed in the 1950s. The series depicted young, teary-eyed younglings. While it may seem strange to want an image of a weeping child on your wall, the pictures proved popular all over the world. For example, in the UK alone, over 50,000 copies were sold. The children represented were often poor and very beautiful. In total, Giovanni painted over 60 paintings, and up until the early 80s, prints and reprints of his images continued to be mass produced. In 1985, the most popular tabloid newspaper in the United Kingdom printed a story that caused panic and ended the popularity of his work. The Sun published an article entitled Blazing Curse of the Crying Boy, describing the terrible experience of May and Ron Hall after their home was destroyed by fire. The cause of the fire, much like Bob's grandmother's, was a greasy pan that overheated and burst into flames. The fire spread rapidly and destroyed everything on the ground floor of the home. Only one item remained intact, print of the crying boy on their living room wall. Distraught at their loss, the devastated couple made the bizarre claim that the painting was cursed and it, not the pan, was the cause of the fire. Now, this tale probably would have disappeared into the archives of strange and mysterious stories, except for one, um, tiny thing. A firefighter claimed that he had attended at least 15 house fires where everything was destroyed except for Prince of the Crying Boy, which would remain completely intact. So before long, this gathered momentum, and a rash of fires all over the world were blamed on the cursed child, not to be confused with the play that's currently running of the same name. In subsequent articles, the Sun went on to claim that a woman had lost her house to a fire six months after buying the painting, two sisters had fires in their homes after buying a copy of the painting, when one sister even claimed to have seen her painting sway backwards and forwards on the wall while it was happening, a concerned woman on the Isle of Wight attempted to burn her painting without success and then went on to suffer a run of very bad luck, a gentleman in Nottingham who possessed a print of the painting lost his home and his family was injured, a pizza parlor got destroyed, including every painting on their walls except for 
the crying boy, when the Sun reported that even rational firefighters refused to have a copy of this painting in their homes, the reputation of the crying boy was damned forever. In all these cases, and many more that were reported, paintings of the crying boy went unharmed. Eventually, there was an image of a crying child by any artist in a house that went on fire. Now, some folks claimed that they experienced bad luck if they attempted to destroy or even get rid of the paintings, while others were convinced that it was only a matter of time before disaster struck them. The Sun eventually offered the frightened public a solution. On Halloween night of 1985, hundreds of the paintings were collected together by the newspaper and burnt under the supervision of the fire brigade. So why would this seemingly innocent series of paintings be cursed? Theories ranged from the little boy being from a Romani family who placed a curse on the artist, to others claiming that the subject of the painting had died in a fire and his spirit was trapped in the art. The most enduring story claimed that the boy accidentally set fire to the studio of Giovanni Bregolin. Simply put, wherever the little orphan went, fires mysteriously followed earning him the name Diablo or Devil. Number 5. The Bassano Vase When we think of cursed objects, we start to go through the classics, you know, haunted dolls, haunted paintings, even the old haunted diamond. You don't tend to think of haunted glassware. Well. Let the Bassano vase introduce itself. A seemingly unassuming piece of home decor, this sinister flower pot carries with it a deadly curse and legacy. First crafted in the 15th century, the Bassano vase was given to a bride as a wedding gift in Napoli, Italy. The day of the wedding, the husband couldn't find his betrothed anywhere. Upon returning home, he found her on the floor, clutching the vase. After her funeral, the vase was given out to one of her family members, who then fell ill within days and had passed away. Of course, no one assumed the vase had anything to do with it, why would it, despite a suspicious trail already starting to form. The third person to inherit the vase also ended up passing away mysteriously. Huh. Well after the third mysterious death in months, the family contacted a local priest for advice on their situation, and he gave them some reasonable advice. Bury it on hollowed grounds, where no one would find it again. It lay dormant until it was dug up in 1988 by an amateur antique hunter who sold the vase off quickly, restarting the treacherous cycle where it traveled once again, ending lives mysteriously and ruining an otherwise nicely decorated living room. After its revival, it was brought to the attention of local police. They tried to pass it off to museums or cultural sites, but understandably no one wanted anything to do with the wretched pot. So with nowhere else to turn, legend goes that the police returned it where they had once been found, buried deep beneath hallowed ground. Hopefully a little bit deeper this time. Maybe in a lockbox with three padlocks and throw away the keys into the ocean. You know, just to be safe. Are you enjoying yourself, my little ghouls and goblins? Click the subscribe button down below for daily frights from Top 5 Scary. Number 4. The Iceman. The Iceman cometh for us all. In 1991, on the peak of the Otzel Alps in Italy, a pair of mountaineering tourists came across what they thought was a deceased hiker, which in a grandiose sense was kind of true. Not a recent passing, however, because the Iceman in question was dated from 3000 BC. The nature of his passing is unknown, so the criminal could still be out there at large. A fascinating find for the scientific community, the Iceman, nicknamed Otzi after the mountain he was found in, shined a light on history previously unseen. Otzi was the oldest body ever discovered with tattoos, history's first bad boy, if you will. After being unearthed, the body was brought to Austria to be studied intensively, but nothing the researchers discovered could have prepared them for the curse that they had unearthed. A worrying amount of people involved in the study of the Iceman found themselves befelled to an ancient unearthed evil. The first man to discover Otzi, one of the hikers, fell off a path on a mountain to his doom. A mountaineer passed in an avalanche. A forensic pathologist was involved in a lethal car accident en route to give a speech at a university about the Iceman. In total, seven researchers involved in the study of the Iceman and observers found themselves losing their life after meeting him. So where is the Iceman now? Hopefully supervised? Well, Otzi is currently being held in the South Tyrol Museum of Archaeology down in the bottom of Italy, where he is kept in a climate controlled environment to maintain his preservation. Locked away, visitors are permitted to come see the Iceman, but only through a frozen thick glass window. Is that room to keep him cool and preserved, or is it to keep whatever curse lay dormant inside his bones docile? All we know is that we're thankful that Otzi's just chillin'. Number 3. The Grand Grimoire Our next entry has been formally referred to as the Gospel of Satan. It's different from Satan's Bible and is said to be a cursed book whose knowledge had to be sealed away to protect humanity. So this might be the most dangerous book ever published after Hop on Pop. The Grand Grimoire was said to have been penned by a priest in the 
16th century, who was possessed by a litany of demons who compelled the man to put their knowledge to paper. Acting as a scribe for the demons, the man wrote everything they knew about dark incantations, spells, instructions on how to cast rituals, how to bind a demon to make it do your bidding. Wait, a demon wrote this book? A demon gave instructions about how it wants to be bound to a human and serve humans? That's a freaky little demon. That's not all though. There's a step by step recipe for a little necromancy if you're down to dabble in some dark arts and make some bones dance to your rhythm. The book really covers all the fun stuff you've been told not to do. Now it's just, it's not all brimstone and hellfire too. There's a rituals on how to manipulate your luck, how to conduct a seance, and I think this is adorable. But there's even ways to make people love you in the book. Now a little dating tip from your friends at Top 5 Scary, I will say if you need a demon's help to make them like you, that might not be the most successful relationship, but you do you, don't let me get in the way. Now if all of this is sounding pretty appealing, and I don't blame you because it all does sound really cool, just know that the book is considered high treason. Even so much as cracking the spine is considered equivalent to selling your soul, so maybe hold off on that Amazon order for a bit. Besides, because of the book's cursed reputation, the original copy is said to be locked away in the Vatican's famous secret archives, and no matter how many times you ask, they're not going to let you look at it, even if you say you just want to take a quick little peek at the illustrations. I know, so unfair. Ugh, I don't even have any late fees. Let me take the book out. Number two, the untitled grimoires. You think a book with a name is scary? Imagine a book without a name. Coming up next on our list of haunted nighttime reading is the untitled grimoires. It was so scary they couldn't even deign to give it a name. The books are said to originate from a Wiccan high priestess named Persephone Adarasta Irene, who has one of the coolest names I've ever heard. She recorded a book of her family's spiritual history. These manuscripts record Persephone's Wiccan history that she reworked all through her adult life. The first book contains around 250 pages of spells, incantations, curses, enchantments, and some information on gems, planets, rites, potions, and exorcisms. Basically anything and anything everything that a fledgling sorceress or warlock could ever possibly want. The second book has a little more light, you know, the sequel's a bit of a letdown. It's just alchemy, chemistry, cures, perfumes, and tonics. Now the first book is believed to be the one to carry the curse, as Persephone's spells are believed in Wiccan culture to contain more power than most other records due to her embodiment of her own soul inside the book. They say all authors put a bit of soul in their work, and it seems as if the Wiccan high priestess took that a bit more literally than most of us do. These books would eventually find their way into the possession of one Alice Montserrat, a close working associate of Alistair Crowley, who you know from earlier in the video as one of the most famous practicers of the occult and lover of white horses. Montserrat left an inscription in the first page of the book, warning to all of those who open it, to those not of the craft, the reading of this book is forbidden. Proceed no further, or justice will exact a swift and terrible retribution, and you will surely suffer at the hands of the craft. This was written in several languages to make sure it came across to just about anybody who opened the book. Now I'm kind of unclear on that, I don't know, some of the old words, the old English is kind of confusing me. Does that mean the book should be read like it's good? I, I don't know, not really getting that. And finally coming in at her number one spot today on demonic dictionaries and evil literature is the infamous Lesser Key of Solomon. Make no mistake from the title, even though it's a Lesser Key of Solomon, it is not a lesser evil. It's an anonymously authored grimoire on demonology, so not written by Solomon. It's also known as Clavicula Solomonis Regis or Lemegeton, is a grimoire. It's a book of magic that gained significant prominence in occult literature. Now the grimoire is attributed to King Solomon, the biblical figure renowned for his wisdom and mastery over supernatural forces. It's believed to have been compiled in the 17th century, though it draws upon earlier occult tradition and texts. The Lesser Key consists of several sections or books, each focusing on a different aspect of magic and summoning. The most well known is the Ars Goetia, which represents descriptions and instructions for evoking 72 demons or spirits, each with its own unique powers and abilities, kind of like Pokemon. These demons are said to be bound by King Solomon and can be summoned and controlled by skilled practitioners. 
practitioners. Other sections of the Lesser Key of Solomon include fan favorites like the Ars Theurgia Gorisha, Ars Paulina, Ars Almadel, and Ars Notoria. These sections delve into topics such as angelic invocations, the use of talismans and amulets, and rituals for obtaining divine knowledge and wisdom. Now, The grimoire has had a profound influence on various occult and magical traditions, including ceremonial magic, demonology, and the practice of spirit conjuration. It's been studied and referenced by countless practitioners, scholars, and scary YouTubers throughout history. Now, you know, goes without saying, this is a potentially dangerous text. The act of summoning and working with entities described in the grimoire is not for the faint of heart, and really should be saved for those with a bit of spiritual expertise under their wizard hat. In conclusion, significant grimoire. Number 5 The Shadow Doll Coming up on the number 5 spot today is part of the collection owned by the late Ed and Lorraine Warren, big top 5 scary fan favorites. One of the first items you'll see when entering the Warren's Haunted Museum is this terrifying little shadow doll made of bird feathers and real human teeth. The Warren's son-in-law and current proprietor of the now defunct museum, Tony Spera, offers a little bit of insight on the doll, saying it was originally acquired at an antique shop where it was being sold, with the owners of the shop being none the wiser of the doll's evil. That's completely on the antique shop owner though, you know, you come into a possession of a doll made of bird feathers and human teeth, your first instinct should not be to stick a price tag on it, you should toss it into the ocean or burn it, something like that. Spara claims that the doll's curse works by taking a photograph of the doll, and then when it develops, you write the curse that you'd like to inflict on the back of the photo, and you send that to your victim. And the person who opens the envelope and sees the doll in the photograph will invite the curse into your home. Now, probably a lot of pictures of the shadow doll behind me, or pictures of the shadow doll being interspersed in this video right now. I just want to tell you, I don't have any curses in mind. I didn't write any curses down. I don't have a negative thought inside my head, buddy. I barely have thoughts inside my head as is. If I would curse you with anything, I would curse you to always find loose change, always get texts back from your crush, and I'd curse you to always make the right amount of pasta. I'd only curse you of good things. Now, the real question I have to ask about this scary shadow doll is do you think it's jealous that it's not the most famous haunted doll in the Warren's Museum? I know I would probably have a very hard time sitting next to Annabelle all day. Everyone's coming to gawk and take photos at my movie star sister. Ugh, hard life. Nobody's gonna make any movies about me. No wonder that doll was cursing people. And if you're looking for more stories about cursed dolls, I've got lots and lots and lots and lots of those. But I've got lots of other scary things too. Aliens, ghouls, goblins, conspiracies, just about anything you can think up, I've done a video or two on it. So hit subscribe. Please make sure you hit that little bell as well. That means you get every one of the videos we make. But do that at the end of this video if you wouldn't mind. Because I got four more crazy cursed objects coming up for you right about now. Number 4. Cursed Ballista Balls Like the last couple years had everybody acting pretty pretty strange. I think it was unprecedented times. Maybe you binged all of Tiger King in a day. Maybe you got really into making sourdough. Maybe you returned a cursed artifact you stole when you were a teenager. We all went through some personal development. In 2020, a source that chooses to remain anonymous returned an ancient artifact that they'd stolen as a teenager to the Israeli government a Bronze Age ballista ball fired during the Great Jewish Revolt by the Romans. The thief swiped them as a teenager when visiting with a group of friends and went on to live a fairly normal life, a successful career, found a partner, sired some children. Throughout his entire life, he felt as if there was a weight over him, as if he had some invisible presence of guilt weighing down on him forever. And he said no matter how long it had been, or how much his life had moved past this childhood act of delinquency, his heart could never move on from it, and he felt as if he'd been cursed to forever bear the guilt of it. During the events of the last few years, he said it stirred in him this apocalyptic feeling that made him want to return the ballista balls in the hopes of finally clearing his conscience. Do you think at any point during all that, during all that fun stuff during the quarantine and everything, do you, do you think he was ever worried that he might have accidentally done it by moving those ballista balls and that's why he had to put them back? Through Facebook, he ended up getting put towards the right channels within the government to return it. But you know what's really bizarre about this bizarre story? This isn't even the first time this has happened, because in 2015 an almost identical story played out. In 2015, two ballista balls were returned to Israeli authorities alongside a note stating, I took these in 1995 from a residential quarter at the foot 
of the summit. They have brought me nothing but trouble. Please do not steal antiquities. Well, I've got to say it's a nice change of pace to hear about people trying to undo a curse before anything got too heated. And you know what? I like these stories. It's a very easy to follow message for those of us listening at home. Don't steal antiquities. Unless you're Indiana Jones, that should be some pretty easy advice to follow in your life. Number three, the Delphi Sapphire. The Delphi Sapphire is a seemingly beautiful gem that carries with it a dark legacy. It's also known as the Gem of Sorrow, named for the misfortune it brings upon all those who owned it. Its first owner was a British cavalryman named Colonel Ferris, who stole the gem from a sacred temple in India in the 18th century. Soon after returning to England, he was plagued with financial destitution, bringing his family to the brink of collapse. Shortly after this, his family all started to develop debilitating diseases. Ferris suspected that the gem was responsible for these wrongdoings, and attempted to pass it off to a family friend who fell gravely ill immediately after taking it in. Shortly after Ferris's friend passed, the gem was bought by Edward Heron Allen, a scientist who similarly experienced his life falling apart after acquiring the gem. In a desperate attempt to free himself of the curse, Edward threw the gem into Regent's Canal, thinking that he'd freed himself of the accursed stone. Sadly, much like the one true ring, this gem wasn't going to stay at the bottom of a river. It was fished out of the canal and quickly sold to a local jeweler, who recognized the stone as one he had mounted onto a ring for a client, one Edward Heron Allen. Thinking he was doing Edward a favor, the jeweler crafted a new ring and returned it to Edward. Isn't that nice? From there on, Edward swiftly tried to rid himself of it again, this time giving it off to a singer, who after a brief ownership, lost her voice entirely and never sang again. With the ring once again in his possession, Edward decided to end the vicious cycle of re-gifting and lock the sapphire away. He locked it in seven stacked boxes surrounded by good luck charms and gave it to his bank to store in their vault until his passing. Never to be opened, never to be sold. Heron even advised the bank that after his passing, it should be kept for another 33 years, just in case there was any residual curse smell in the box, I guess. Anyway, eventually, the sapphire found its way to a museum, as these things always do, who upon opening the seven boxes, found inside a letter reading, This sapphire is accursed, and stained with the blood and dishonor of everyone who has ever owned it. Whoever opens this box, do with it what you wish. My advice, however, is to throw it into the sea. Number two, James Dean's car. Absolutely nothing is cooler than driving a souped up Porsche, and in the 1950s, there was no one cooler than James Dean. Aside from being the cultural face of 1950s teenage delusionment and an icon for outcasts of his day, James Dean had a passion for cars and racing, and had a collection of impeccable Porsches, although the last one he would ever own was a Porsche Spider 550. It was actually commissioned for Dean, and was one of the first makes of that car produced. A souped up Porsche capable of race speeds, it seemed like the perfect car for a hot-headed rebel. But from the moment he got it, people were wary. A friend of Dean's, actor Alec Guinness, wrote in his diary after meeting James with the car that the sports car looked sinister to me, exhausted, hungry. I found myself saying in a voice I could hardly recognize, please never get in that car. You will be found dead. Normally any friend telling you outright not to get into a car would be worth paying attention to, but I feel like special triple warning should be heeded if it was Obi-Wan Kenobi telling me not to do it. Sure enough, Dean ignored, went ahead and raced the car anyway, leading to a tragic car accident that would claim the actor's life. Shortly thereafter, the spider was chopped for parts, where its engine was bought by Dr. William Eskrick and installed in his own car. The suspension and transmission of the spider was given to Eskrick's colleague and fellow doctor and racing enthusiast, Troy McHenry. In a race in 1956, both doctors Doctors driving cars with the Porsche's old parts both crashed, leading to the death of McHenry and injuring Eskirk. Somehow, not learning any lessons, the self-proclaimed king of customs, George Barris, purchased the mangled wreck of the 550, hoping to rebuild it as a tourist attraction, where it was sold to the National Safety Council as a harrowing display of road safety. In 1959, while in storage, the car spontaneously caught flame. The tires were sold to a private buyer who had them burst on the road, causing them to careen off. And finally, in 1960, while in transit from Miami, the car disappeared entirely. The whereabouts of the car and its pieces are currently unknown, with the only confirmed part left being a transaxle that was found in Massachusetts. And finally, at our number one spot, the devil's rocking chair. When we think of a devil sitting atop a throne, our mind isn't likely to conjure up the image of a rocking chair. That's more for kindly old grandparents. But for the Glatzel family, it was all too real. Seemingly an unassuming piece of leisure furniture, this twisted piece of haunted mahogany became the focus of one of America's most notorious exorcisms. In the early 1980s, the young son of the Glatzel family, David Glatzel, claimed that he was being plagued by nightmares of a creature with jagged teeth, twisted horns, and hooves. And the family was worried, as the boy wasn't really the kind to make things up. The boy insisted that he would see this beast sitting in the chair, rocking, watching him, laughing, threatening to steal his soul away. You know, regular old imaginary friend stuff. The visions persisted and even manifested physically, with David waking up in the middle of the night with scratches, bruises, and cuts, as well as red marks around his neck, as if something had been grabbing his throat. He would convulse during the night. 
and a family member would watch him sleep as he would have seizures repeatedly. David started to hiss and growl at his family, and even was reported to have spoken tongues, quoting from the Bible. Eventually it became too much for the family to bear, and professional help was brought in from, who else? Ed and Lorraine Warren, who performed multiple exorcisms, and brought in a series of priests to try and quell the spirits inside the house. Lorraine asserts that she saw the chair levitate in her time there. After a final exorcism, it's reported that the demon left young David, but found its way into his sister's fiance, one Arne Johnson. She reported the same growls, hissing, as well as slipping into periodic trances he couldn't be shook from. Tragically, Arne was involved in a conflict that led to the death of his landlord, and when he stood trial for it, insisted that he hadn't acted on it, but rather it was the demon possessing him that made him do it. He was locked away. After these dark events, the chair was kept away in storage, for fear that its evils might seep into the rest of the world. It resides now in the haunted museum, owned by Zach Baggins himself, one of the world's foremost experts on the paranormal, and a sort of modern successor to the Warrens, who's indisputably the wisest man to be owning something like this. Let's just hope he's not looking to get comfortable in it anytime soon. In fifth place, we have Ed's paintings. So long before they were famed ghost hunters investigating enough the Amityville horror and featured in films such as The Conjuring, Ed and Lorraine had a much different hobby. Painting. Actually, it was how the duo made a living. Ed Warren was a trained fine arts painter. The duo traveled all over the country to sell their paintings, and they also taught art classes. The couple used Ed's paintings as a way to gain entry into houses they wanted to investigate. They would research houses they believed to be haunted, and then drive to the house. After Ed painted the house in question, he would then hand the painting to Lorraine, who would go up, knock on the door, and offer the homeowners a painting, which would usually turn into a conversation about the property and the hauntings. This process was how their investigative career began. Ed became known for his barn door art, painting tranquil winter scenes on stained pine, which was all the range for adorning the wood grain halls of any home in the late 60s, and apparently these paintings are now quite rare. Many of his paintings that have been photographed feature different haunted houses, and examples of his art and calligraphy style are displayed throughout the museum. In fourth place, we have black magic masks. These fall under the practice of tulpa, which is a concept in theosophy, mysticism, and the paranormal of a materialized thought form, typically in human form, such as an imaginary friend or being that is created through spiritual practice and intense concentration. In simpler English, the masks act as a representation of the practice, which is a form of mysticism that involves creating sentient and autonomous beings separate from oneself. So. An imaginary friend? The concept of tulpas and their creation, including the word tulpa, come from a close in Tibetan Buddhist practice, with tulpa being a Tibetan word for creature of the mind. Talpas did not become part of Western paranormal lore until the 1970s, and those who practice have been cited as wearing masks similar to Halloween ones in order to take on the appearance of whatever the mask looks like. I guess that explains why I've seen many cheap looking Halloween masks in the video walkthroughs from the museum, so I suppose I'll retract my statements that I made about how pathetic they look. If anyone is curious about modern practices and appropriations of Talpamancers, the interweb origins can be traced back to 4chan message boards in 2009, and no, if you don't know what that means, I'm not going to elaborate on just how cursed that sentence was to utter. Oh, it gets worse. All right. The communities gained popularity when adult fans of My Little Pony started discussing tulpas of characters from the Friendship is Magic television series. The fans attempted to use meditation and lucid dreaming techniques to create imaginary friends. Look, I knew someone back in high school who fell under that subculture, and he was the furthest thing from mentally stable. The guy had to. Uh, people munching fantasies as well. Uh, time to move on before I get nightmares again. Number three, the mummy. Not actually a mummy, but the mummy board, or coffin, or lid. The board is painted of an unknown high status woman from the 21st or 22nd dynasty. Time scale for you, that's about a thousand years BCE. The British Museum's unlucky mummy has earned quite the reputation for causing destruction through its ancient curse. The mummy was found at Thebes in Greece in the late 1800s, and tales of its curse started soon after its discovery. It's said that of the four young Englishmen who bought it, two died in a shooting accident, and two died of health problems. A string of illnesses, accidents, and deaths following this are said to be attributed to the lid. One of the most infamous rumors about the mummy's curse is that it caused the sinking of the Titanic. Wait a minute, what? One of the victims on board was a journalist who apparently was the first to publish articles about the mummy's find and the curse that went with it. Survivors from the disaster recall hearing stories about the ship of an ominous artifact that has a sinister reputation. As the mummy's stories and the rumors spread, 
people who survived began to ask the question if the rumors had caused the disaster that night. The unlucky mummy is now an ancient Egyptian artifact in the collection of the British Museum in London. The identity of the original owner is still being studied and the related causes brought on by it. Due to the brief hieroglyphic inscriptions of short religious phrases, scientists are still trying to decipher the name and the curse that comes along with it, and the actual location of where the body disappeared to. It's been feared since the discovery in the late 1880s, and the mummy's lid has acquired a reputation credited with causing death, injury, and large-scale disasters, earning the nickname the unlucky mummy. None of these stories have any basis in fact, of course, but the mummy serves as a spiritual question mark and remains a mystery to scientists who crack the code open. Yo, where's Brendan Fraser when you need him, right? He can figure this whole thing out. Number two, the haunted bed. Apparently there's a bed that makes you more dizzy and have more sinister evil visions than that of a night on a waterbed. Yeah, I've had a couple hungover nights lost at sea, let me tell ya. Gets pretty choppy out there. Highly don't recommend it. But this bed, I also highly don't recommend. The lavishly ornate Great Bed of Ware does not like you sleeping in it. The hardwood oak bed is richly decorated and carved with figures and scenes you could daydream for, well, days over. It's so large that it's rumored to comfortably sleep four couples. Yeah. Talk about a California king. There is a tale that suggests that the bed was made in the 15th century for King Edward IV by a very gifted carpenter, but through the years found itself being passed between the inns of wear where commoners were able to sleep in it, break the legs, and apparently cover it head to toe in graffiti. Yeah, the disrespect alone. The defacing got so bad that apparently the ghost of the maker haunts those who are not of royal blood. Basically not blessed by God to rule. It's so old and so haunted that apparently people who spend the night are woken up violently by spectacles watching them sleep. Apparently there are so many initials carved into the wood, images drawn on it, that it's hard to know who actually the bed was originally fitted for, and who actually cursed it. Some researchers believe that the curse surrounding the bed could have actually been carved into it with symbols and text that hexed the next user. Whatever its history, it's haunted haunted. The bed can now be found in the British galleries of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. We need like the Long Island medium to take a nap in it, you know what I mean? See what she thinks. And coming in at the number one spot, the Terracotta Army. The Terracotta Army was discovered in 1974 by a group of farmers. Yang Zifa, his five brothers and neighbor were digging a well east of the Quin Emperor's tomb mound at Mount Lee. For centuries, occasional reports mentioned pieces of terracotta figures and fragments of the Quin necropolis. Roofing tiles, bricks, and masonry were regularly found. But when they discovered heads, Chinese archeologists started to investigate. To this day, it remains the largest pottery figure group ever found. The Terracotta Army seemed to be a collection of terracotta sculptures depicting the armies of Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. It is a form of funerary art buried with the emperor around 209 BCE with the purpose of protecting the emperor in the afterlife. The figures were discovered in Lingtong County outside Shaanxi, China. The figures vary in height according to their rules and they're all dressed in different garbs, the tallest of course being the generals. These statues include warriors, chariots equipped with horses, Horses, more than 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots, 520 horses, and 150 cavalry. Other terracotta non-military figures were found in pits close by, including officials, acrobats, strongmen, and musicians. Yo, are we sure that Medusa didn't just like make her way through China and start stoning people in time with her looks? Because that's like an entire city made out of clay. In the records of the Grand Historian, China's 24 dynastic histories, it was written that work on the mausoleum began in 246 BCE soon after Emperor Quinn ascended the throne. Apparently the project involved 700,000 workers. Yeah, I'd really hope so, because that many perfectly sculpted figures are so realistic, there must have been a city of artists. The site is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and has been since 1987. This is scary just looking at it. I'm not convinced this was just an art project for the journey between spirit realms. I think this was used as a decoy for battle. 20,000 figurines just chilling, waiting? Seems pretty intimidating to me. Whatever its origins, it's jarring to look at. What do you think? Number five, the book of the sacred magic of Abramelin the mage. The book of Abramelin, or more formally, the book of the sacred magic of Abramelin the mage is a Jewish magic text that is thought to date back at some point in the 14th or 15th century. Now it wasn't this initial publication that gave it such a notoriety. There wasn't really a lot of book reviewing going on back then. It was when it was upheld by the 19th and 20th century magicians who made up the hermetic order of the gold 
Golden Dawn, which kind of sounds like a fake bad guy from an RPG, but is a British secret society dedicated to the practice, research, and upholding of old occult magic ways. Can't be that secret though, because I'm talking about it. One of the founders of the Golden Dawn, one SLM Matters, created the first ever English translation of the book in the 1890s, drawing from a 17th century French translation. Mathers' translation became the definite magic text of the 19th century, eventually helping inspire Aleister Crowley, the legendary occultist and fixer of one of the best Ozzy Osbourne songs ever. There's all kinds of spells and magic inside the text. Some highlights include spells on how to conjure someone into a donkey, summon a monkey to do your bidding, how to bring forth spirits to fetch you goods. The key point in the text, however, is an epic multi-month ritual that if performed correctly will allow the sorcerer to commune with their guardian angel other half. The book posits that everyone's guardian angel is another part of their essence, a spiritual other. The ritual involves, oh, um, I don't really know how to say this politely. You have to get um, um, blissfully intimate with the angel, and, and once this honeymoon period is over, the caster then has to summon up and conquer unredeemed spirits of the infernal regions of hell to conquer them, and then will be able to be master of the spirit domain. That all sounds pretty complicated though, honestly, so all things considered, maybe it's for the best that this one's locked away. I don't really need to mess with magic, that's above my pay grade, and I'm not looking to get too intimate with my significant other guardian angel anytime soon. But if you're looking for more true tales of terror, fake frightening fibs, cursed relics, ancient evils, ancient crypt aliens, conspiracies, ghouls, goblins, and way more of this guy, Top 5 Scary is the only place to be. So stay subscribed, make sure you hit that little bell so you don't miss a scream, but, and I know this is a big ask, do that at the end of this video, because I got four more curse books coming for you right now. Number four, the Codex Gigas. When it comes to cursed and demonic books, the Codex Gigas is one of the biggest ones around. Like, literally. Codex Gigas translates to giant book, which isn't a very scary name. But when you see the size of this behemoth, it starts to make a bit more sense. The thing is massive, two feet long. While giant oversized illuminated manuscripts were fairly common around this era, this one stood out for its immense size and also the impressively scary rumors surrounding the cursed text. It's occasionally been dubbed Satan's Bible due to the interesting legend behind its origin. Now supposedly the story goes that a monk by the name of Herman the Reclus, Herman the Reclus, which same, honestly. Anyway. Herman was condemned to death for heresy and was to be walled up alive and starved. In a desperate plea to save himself, Herman tried to convince the prior and the abbot that if he could pen a manuscript to honor God's glory and contained all of human knowledge and history in one night that he could be let free. The abbot agreed, thinking that this was, of course, an impossible task. Well, he didn't know that Herman was the John Wick of penmanship, who wrote until midnight, wearing his fingertips down, and in a moment of desperation, made a prayer to Lucifer, and asked for his eternal soul in exchange for the book's completion in order to repent for his heresy. I totally get it, you know? I've done some pretty crazy things trying to write my scripts in time for a deadline too. I sold my soul earlier this week to get top five UFOs in on time. I get it. Now, not poking any holes in your logic here though, Herman, but I will say maybe, maybe selling your soul to the devil is part of the reason you got into this mess because that actually sounds a ton like heresy. A variation of the legend states that Herman worked for years on the manuscript, day and night, but still asked for the devil's assistance anyway, the lazy bastard. Anyway, the legend states that Satan signed the Bible with an illustration of himself. The ego on that guy. The book contains a birth of information. Like they said, it was supposed to be everything humanity had attained up to that point. Now these days, the Codex Gigas is preserved in the Natural Museum in Sweden, where you can admire the line work of Herman the Recluse and his ghost author, Satan. Number three, the woman of Lem. How modern art can be a bit confusing. It's hard to understand an artist's true meaning behind their work, especially when things start to get abstract. Looking at the woman from Lem statue, it's hard to even make out what this is supposed to be. A fertility statue? Primitive bog roll holder? You wouldn't even know just by looking at it just how lethally cursed this statue is. We don't know who crafted this or why. But we do know that under no circumstances whatsoever should you ever touch the Woman of Lem statue, lest you're looking to incur the wrath of a centuries old evil. The statue was first uncovered in 1878 in Lem, Cyprus, giving the statue its name. Carbon dating suggests the statue was formed around 3000 BC. Hey, wait a minute. Do you think Otzi the Iceman ever saw this statue? 
You think maybe it's the same curse? Was life just significantly more cursed back then? Now back on hand to the topic. Once the statue was found, it began to wreak havoc almost immediately. Legend says four families are purported to have lost someone after touching the statue. The first owner, one Lord Elfont, a lord during Cyprus's time as a colony, lost seven members of his family after acquiring the statue. Sometime afterwards, the next lord to acquire it, Ivor Minucci, obtained the statue and lost his entire family in the span of four years. The next victim, one and Lord Thompson Knoll, just like the others, his family passed away within four years. The stories say that eventually, his remaining surviving sons, understanding that they had a responsibility to rid themselves of this generational evil, gave the statue off to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh for safekeeping, or maybe just to pass the curse along like a vicious cycle of regifting. Within a year, the museum curator passed away mysteriously. Right now, it's still kept there, locked away behind a glass box never to be touched again by human hands. Let's try and keep it that way. Number 2. The Hope Diamond Now the Hope Diamond has shown up a few times on this channel before, and for good reason. It's considered one of the most haunted objects on the planet. The diamond was first uncovered in India, with reports claiming that the diamond was plucked from the eye of a statue of the goddess Sita, the goddess of beauty and devotion. Legend has it that the first person who ever stole the diamond was attacked by dogs shortly after taking it. From here, the diamond made its way through countless hands, never staying in one pair of hands for too long though. It's said to have been owned by King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, who as far as I know, never had anything too bad happen to them. You know, at least nothing worth losing your head over. That's a little history joke for you. Look up the French Revolution, or Assassin's Creed Unity, it's the same thing. Throughout the diamond's storied history, it's been said that just about Every owner of the Hope Diamond suffered a horrific fate. 14 confirmed deaths and owners throughout history, and that's only the ones we know of, as there could be countless more. The jeweler who recut the stone into its current form, William Falls, died a ruined man in poverty and hardship after his son Hendrik stole the stone from his father, who would later be prompted to take his own life as repentance for his crime. After passing from owner to owner under grisly circumstances, it finally made its way to Harry Winston, an American jeweler who, possibly making the first smart choice of anyone on this list, thought it better better to play with his odds, and donated the diamond to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in 1958, where it currently resides sealed away to this day. So what happened when it became museum property? Well, the curators of the Smithsonian were thrilled to receive it, and have said that they consider the gem a crown jewel of their diamond collection, and that in all the time it's been in their watch, no one has suffered any ill effects, and if anything, visitors have gone up. Maybe Indiana Jones was right. Maybe it belongs in a museum. Number 1. King Tut now, number one on our list might be a little bit esoteric. It's the curse of King Tutankhamun. So not quite an object, but worth noting. King Tutankhamun, or King Tut as his close friends like to call him, is arguably the most famous pharaoh of all time. Uncovering his tomb was a landmark moment in Egyptology and archaeology, with his tomb serving as something of a golden goose for archaeologist Howard Carter, who spearheaded the excavation attempts of King Tut's tomb. It took years upon years of concentrated efforts hunting for it, but in 1922, Howard Carter, under the commission of Lord Carnarvon, uncovered the late Pharaoh's mighty tomb. Howard Carter, Lord Carnarvon, and their companion Evelyn Beauchamp, the daughter of Carnarvon, were the first people to ever step inside King Tutankhamun's resting place in centuries. Unfortunately, it wouldn't go so well for them. The first victim was Lord Carnarvon. Upon entering the tomb, he was bitten by a mosquito, and mere weeks later, the bite became deeply infected poisoning his blood, leading to a loss of life. The author of Sherlock Holmes, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, upon reading this story in the news, had theorized that there was a curse put in place by the old gods watching over Tutankhamun's tomb. And that's the guy who created Sherlock Holmes, so let's assume he's probably pretty smart and doesn't just jump to conclusions. The next victim, George Gould, was a visitor to the tomb, who developed an intense fever shortly after walking through it. Within months, he had passed away. Next was A.C. Mace, a digger on the excavation team, passed from an intense Hence case of pneumonia shortly after his involvement. Howard Carter's secretary, Captain Bethel, was the next victim, passing away six years after the unearthing under mysterious circumstances believed to have been smothered in his sleep. Now Howard Carter, the original excavationist who helmed the venture, didn't believe anything about the curse, claiming that it was all superstition and coincidence not fitting an educated man. He complained, however, that after unearthing the tomb, whenever he would visit Egypt, he noticed repeated sightings of jackals, the same type of Anubis 
the Egyptian god of the dead. Which I've got to say, if I recently uncovered a legendary pharaoh and interrupted his slumber to plunder his riches for my personal gain, I would probably be a bit wary about seeing a symbol of the god of the dead following me around. 16 years later, Howard Carter would pass away of Hodgkin's disease. Could he have been the last victim of the curse? Or did he manage to escape its throes? The king still rests in his tomb in Cairo, where he shall not be disturbed. You're more than welcome to go visit him if you'd like, but please, be respectful. Our first spot is the Anguished Man painting, a painting that's been said to be haunted by the spirit of its former artist. The Anguished Man was painted by... We have no idea, actually. Fittingly, for something like this, its true origin is a mystery, but it's been said that it was painted with a mixture of the artist's own blood and paint, which explains that delightful crimson hue. The artist disappeared after painting it, and in 30 years, no one has been able to trace its origin to anyone. The earliest recorded history of the Anguished Man comes from a woman in North England who owned the painting after receiving it as a gift and understood that there was something deeply, deeply wrong with it, but kept it anyway, I guess. After years of having it in her possession, she gave the relic off and passed it on to her grandson, Sean Robinson. Once the painting found its way into Sean's possession, he reported consistent hauntings from it, claiming that at night the painting can be heard screaming, writhing, loud noises, the painting falling off the wall in the middle of the night, and even going so far as to claim that he's seen the canvas itself twisting. Locking the painting in his basement, but feeling a compulsion to keep it locked to study it and possibly keep it safe from the outside world, Sean has recorded several videos of the Anguished Man in action if you feel like you've been getting too much sleep lately. While some skeptics might doubt that the Anguished Man is actually haunted, there is absolutely zero doubt that the painting itself is as fascinating as it is terrifying. Robert the Doll. At first glance already seems a bit unsettling, between his empty smile and the blank expression of the pet sitting on his lap. If only it ended there. Legend has it that this century-old doll is home to a malevolent spirit locked away. It's been said that misfortune comes to those who don't respect him or insult him. Robert's story begins over a hundred years ago, and his true origin is somewhat disputed. It's agreed that he was owned by Robert Jean Otto, who received it as a boy, but some people claim that it was a gift from his grandfather, while locals prefer to claim nefariously that the doll was given to Robert by a servant of the house who hexed it out of resentment. Whatever the case, Robert brought trouble with him. The real Robert, or Gene as he went by, would refer to the doll as if it was a living entity, claiming that it had a will of its own. When things around the house would break, like the rest of Gene's toys being destroyed, he claimed that Robert had done it. The family would find Gene in the middle of the night, wailing, surrounded by overturned furniture, claiming once again that Robert had done it. People would claim to see Robert out of the windows, appearing and disappearing at seemingly random times of day. While Gene no longer owns Robert, of course, Robert lives in the East Martello Museum in Florida, where it's said that even locked up, he still causes havoc, causing electronics to malfunction and go haywire. Employees have reported sleepless nights, strange noises, streaks of bad luck after spending time around Robert. The museum claims, too, Robert gets one to three letters a day from people asking for forgiveness or asking him to place a curse on others. If you're ever in the area and you feel like checking in, just make sure you're respectful about it, okay? You never know. Number three. The Women from Lem statue. This limestone statue, also known as the Goddess of Death, was discovered in Lem, Cyprus in 1878. Its purpose, or exactly what it was meant to portray, has been lost to time, but many experts believe it may be a fertility statue of an unknown goddess. Whatever the reason for the carving, experts have concluded that it was carved sometime around 3500 BC. After being found in 1878, it was purchased by a man named Lord Elphon. Within six years of having acquired the object, Elfont and all six of his family members had died under mysterious circumstances. The statue passed to a man named Ivor Manucci, who died along with his entire family within four years of the purchase. The same thing happened to its next owner, Lord Thompson Noel, and his family. The statue seemed to disappear for a time before being acquired by Sir Alan Biverbrook, who had a wife, two daughters, and two sons. Yet again, family members began to drop like flies, with Biverbrook, his daughters, and his wife all passing within a few years. Fearing that they would be next, Biverbrook's sons decided to donate the statue to the Royal Museum in Edinburgh, Scotland, where it was soon put on display. However, the statue was not quite done, and the curator who had handled the statue mysteriously died the next year. The statue is still on display to this day, locked in a heavy glass display case. Number two. Thomas Busby's chair. Our next entry takes us 
to North Yorkshire in 1702, when two criminals, Daniel Audie and his son-in-law, Thomas Busby, came into conflict. They were coin forgers who essentially ran a criminal empire, but Daniel disapproved of Tom's relationship with his daughter. This resulted in a fight which ended with Daniel's untimely demise. Thomas was arrested soon afterwards and sentenced to be there is some variation in what happened next. Some versions of the tale say that Thomas was arrested at his favorite pub, and others say he was allowed back into the bar for his last drink before his death. Whatever the case, before being taken away, he told the other patrons of the pub, May sudden death come to anyone who dare sit in my chair. He was then taken away and as the local historian and poet William Grange described it, the bones of the poor wretch who had committed murder to fester in the sunshine and blow in the tempest, until they fell piecemeal to earth, and tradition yet tells tales of night wanderers being terrified when passing the dreaded spot. While Thomas began apparently haunting the spot across from the inn where his remains were displayed, the curse he laid on the chair began taking effect. Over the years, many brave souls sat on the chair to prove they were not afraid and paid the price. In 1894, a chimney sweep sat in the chair and was found the next day hanging next to where Busby had been displayed. In 1967, two Air Force pilots sat in the chair as a joke, but when they were driving home that night, they crashed into a tree and did not survive. A few years later, a builder sat in the chair and fell off a roof later that same night. Not long after, a cleaner fell into the chair after slipping while mopping the floor and died of a brain tumor soon after. In 1978, the owner of the now renamed Busby Stoop Inn decided that too many deaths had occurred and donated the chair to the Thirsk museum. Although they didn't technically lock the chair away, they did hang the chair on the wall, five feet off the ground, to prevent anyone from sitting on it and receiving Busby's fatal curse. Number 1. The Bassano Vase Although it has fallen out of favor now, for centuries a common gift given to brides on the day of their weddings were intricate ornate vases. Our next tale begins in the 15th century Italy and spans over 500 years. Legend says that on the day of her wedding, a bride in a village near Napoli found a gift with no clue which of the guests had given it to her. It was a four pound silver vase. She decided to put it in her room for safekeeping before the wedding ceremony, but when the ceremony was due to start, the bride was nowhere to be found. The groom went to her room to look for her and found her lifeless body on the ground with no trace of what had caused the death other than her desperately clutching the silver vase. The bride was buried and the vase was passed on to one of her family members to be taken care of. Within days, the second member of the family was dead from unknown causes. The vase was given to another member of the family, and when he also passed away, the family made the connection between all the recent tragedies and the Bassano vase. Unsure what to do, they reached out to a local priest who upon hearing the story informed them that whoever had given it to the bride had either cursed it or made it from cursed materials. He advised them to bury it on sacred grounds. They dug a hole and wrote a note warning, beware. This vase brings death, which they placed inside the cursed vase. The vase was buried and remained underground for the next 500 years. By horrible chance, a man in 1988 was digging and came across the vase. He read the note, but being the skeptical type, discarded it and took the newly found Bassano vase to a local auction house. The vase went up for auction and was sold for the equivalent of $2,270 to the local pharmacist. Within three months, the pharmacist was dead and the vase was sold by his family to to a local doctor, who also passed away soon after. The vase developed a reputation after this, and several people who were approached to purchase it refused, but it was eventually bought by an archaeologist who, despite his family's protests, did not believe in curses. He died three months later. His family threw the vase out their window, but a police officer who was passing by saw this and tried to return it. The family refused the vase back and told him of its cursed nature. He tried to give it to multiple different museums, but having heard about the curse, they all refused. Fearing for his his life, he did what the bride's family had done over 500 years prior and buried it in a lead box in a cemetery. Which cemetery he used is unknown, but let us hope that no unwitting soul rediscovers this cursed vase and unleashes it upon humanity once again.